you're going to look better. You're going to lose weight. You're going to improve your glucose disposal. You're going to improve insulin sensitivity. You're going to be driving a brain derived neurotrophic factor, lowering overall systemic inflammation, all the things. Okay. Hey, Bettys, welcome back to another episode of Better with Dr. Stephanie. It's me, your host, Dr. Stephanie Estima. And this week we are doing the AMA, the Ask Me Anything with yours truly. We are reviving this from from the graveyard with which we had put it a while ago. And I was, you know, I've been thinking about the podcast a lot lately and how much I love it and how much it's sort of become one of truly one of the favorite, my most favorite aspects of the work that I do, which is recording and having conversations with thought leaders and also putting my own body of work out here for you to learn and grow from. And I just remember asking myself, I just had a light bulb moment just the other week. It was like, why are we not doing AMAs anymore? What happened? Why did that stop? So we are unpausing the AMAs and these sets of the set of questions that I am going to be answering for you today came from Instagram. So I had po- uh, posited out a question in my stories, ask me anything for an upcoming podcast episode. We got so many questions, probably enough for the next four. Um, And of course there was a thematic, like a theme that really emerged from these questions. A lot of them around female centric, female specific training, uh, resistance training and cardio and how to supplement and post and pre-workout nutrition uh, and all the things. So we are going to be spending today together talking about what are some of the best practices that you can be uh, invoking in your own life, whether you are resistance training, you're looking to up your game and how we can be driving, let's say, creating your best physique. I, of course, am biased in that I think that building out an hourglass figure, both from an aesthetic point of view, because, you know, y'all know I'm vain. I'm a vain, vain woman. My inner inner seven lady comes out and she wants to be a vain woman. And, you know, so I'm, you know, from an aesthetic perspective, of course, having a, you know, broader shoulders, smaller waist, and then a flare into the hips and the booty is, you know, aesthetically pleasing. But it also confers a lot of longevity benefits as well. So we know that women that have a smaller waist to hip ratio, meaning that your waist is 80% or less uh, the width or the the diameter, let's say, of your hips, uh, this does confer longevity benefits. Really uh, also, of course, in terms of uh, ectopic fat distribution, like as we age, we tend to become more insulin resistant. Our bodies tend to, as we move, especially as we move through menopause, start to become, uh, start to behave more male and that our fat deposition, uh, you know, tendencies also tend to mimic males as well. So in our reproductive years, we tend to have that pair morphology, let's say, where we tend to, under the influence of estrogen, tend to deposit fat in the lower half of the body, much to our dismay while we are in our reproductive years, you know, like to have that big booty, big thighs, you know, that kind of thing. And then as we move into menopause, we often find women will report that their body changes or their fat deposition changes such that now in a lower estrogen environment, we don't have that fat deposition in that lower half of the body that it tends to start to accumulate in the midsection. So through the abdominal area, that kind of so-called spare tire or more apple morphology. I hate both of these terms, by the way. I hate spare tire. I think that that's, or muffin top, you know, that's another word uh, that I'm not a super fan of, but just to kind of give you a visual, like we kind of move from being a pear to an apple. Um, And so really keeping that hourglass figure. And you can, of course, create that through a resistance training uh, regimen and, of course, paired with proper nutrition and, and um, uh, you know, stress management and whatnot. We can really maintain that hourglass figure in our menopausal years and, of course, beyond in postmenopause as well. So with that preamble, on to the show. So the first question uh, is coming in around creatine, which is kind of my favorite supplement. Uh, You know, in the Betty Body, I talked about kind of foundations, uh, vitamin D, magnesium, better than diamonds, still agree. I still have that as a, uh, you know, major guiding principle for me when I'm thinking about supplementation. I'm actually not a big supplement person. Uh, I do tend to air on the minimalist side, like less is more, especially when 
I find that people are like, what's the one supplement that's going to help me with X? It's like, none of them. Have you seen some of the pathways in the body? That being said, a uh, big fan of creatine, especially when it comes to uh, both men and women, but women seem to be afraid of creatine because of the sort of myths around uh, water weight and water bloating. So I want to kind of do a really deep dive into creatine. So this this question is, the official question is, what is your take on creatine for muscle building? This woman is 56. She's on hormone replacement therapy, postmenopausal. So just to kind of give you like a lay of the land, uh, creatine is a combination of three different amino acids, all right? So it's glycine, arginine, and methionine. And this simple yet mighty <laughs> compound is involved in many, many processes in the body. It is a fundamental component, fundamental component in how your body creates ATP. So this is the primary energy source for the myocyte or for the muscle cells. Um, ATP, of course, stands for adenosine triphosphate, uh, which means that there's three phosphate groups there. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so when we are working our muscles intensely, right? So if it, there's an explosive, let's say a contraction, like you might be doing in a resistance training program, um, or, you know, very brief, let's say intense work, um, you know, lasting somewhere in the range of call it, uh, maybe 10 to 15, maybe no more than 15 seconds. Um, creatine is how the muscle creates the energy necessary to do it. Like prior to other sort of energy systems kicking in, um, we have this, uh, creatine system that will help to provide the myocyte with energy. Um, most of the creatine in our bodies are, um, synthesized in the liver and the kidneys. Um, but most of it's stored in the muscle tissue for that sort of brief, I mean, even 15 seconds is a bit much. I'm going to hack that down to 12. So like 10 to 12 seconds of like explosive activity, uh, is where we see that, uh, creatine becoming very, very important in terms of being able to help the muscle cell create energy. Now, creatine is not really um, considered an essential nutrient, um, meaning that the human form, the human body is create, you know, we can create it endogenously, um, but of course it can be obtained through the diet as well. So supplementation is one way. And then of course, um, foods that contain animal products um, as well. Um so if you are someone who's a vegan or vegetarian, know that you the only source that you really have is that endogenously produced one or potentially supplementation uh, with with, um, with uh, creatine. And that's often, you know, when we're thinking about energy, particularly with my vegans and my vegetarians, this is a really important supplement um, for you to consider um, as well. Now, there are many forms of creatine. My favorite by a landslide is something called creatine monohydrate. Uh, it just has one molecule of water uh, attached to it, hence the name monohydrate. Uh, and it's usually like not, you know, somewhere between like 90, call it 90% uh, creatine by weight, uh, by weight. Okay. So as I mentioned before, the phosphate bonded form of creatine is like your body's first choice of energy before we get into uh, oxidative phosphorylation and glycolysis. Like these actually take several seconds to sort of kick in. Um, so this, um, uh, this creatine system is the first and the first line of defense, let's say in getting your muscle tissue energy. And so you can, if you're someone who, you know, eats animal products on a regular basis, uh, you're probably getting enough creatine. If you're somebody who's thinking about performance, uh, such as myself, I also supplement with creatine as well, because when you supplement with creatine monohydrate, this is going to serve to increase the creatine stores and the phosphocreatine availability, which is going to allow the muscle to uh, create ATP at a faster rate. Said another way, um, the more phosphocreatine that you have via creatine supplementation, the more work that you can accomplish. So in the gym, let's say, or even, you know, work in general, uh, before fatigue is going to set in because you have this sort of, uh, phosphocreatine system available to you for creating energy. 
The other reason why creatine is so important is that it draws water into the muscle cell. Okay. So it makes the myocyte, it makes the muscle cell more hydrated. Okay. So this is an important, uh, qualification here because a lot of people think, oh, creatine makes you bloat. Incorrect. (laughs) It doesn't make you bloat. Uh, it draws water inside the cell. Okay. So you are not bloated, but you are drawing muscle inside the cell. And a few things happen when a myocyte is hydrated, the most notable and most important being an increase in muscle protein synthesis. Your muscles do not make muscle protein in the absence of water when you are dehydrated. So this is certainly creatine is going to help to keep the muscle cells hydrated. You also can do that by drinking more water. Okay. Um, many, um, I will, I can, I can attest to, you know, when I am regularly supplementing, um, with creatine, my performance of course is better in the gym. So as I mentioned before, like I can do more work before that fatigue sets in and at the risk of sounding like the cool cats, you know, my muscles look more swole. That's W that's S W O L E. (laughs) Okay. So essentially what I'm saying is that my muscles actually look bigger and fuller, um, which is, which is what you want. If you're somebody who is, who is leaning into building a physique, um, you know, you really want to be trying to improve, like, you know, from an aesthetic perspective, it's going to look better. Your muscles are not going to look flat. They're going to look nice and full. So, uh, for me, I would say that, um, there are a couple of like major supplements that you should be considering to consume on a daily basis. Uh, the ones that I outline in the Betty body, of course, are, you know, vitamin D and magnesium. Potentially if there's inflammation, we can, we can look at turmeric or or curcumin. Um, and if you're somebody who's wanting to augment your performance in the gym, um, you definitely want to be thinking about, um, creatine as well. So for my super nerds uh, who want to know how this actually works, I've been kind of teasing a little bit about the phosphate uh, piece. So after creatine enters the body, uh, it's going to bind with a phosphate molecule and it's going to form creatine phosphate. Okay. So this is, um, this kind of where it gets a little technical. So hang on with me. I know you can, I know you, I know you can stay with me. I know you can stay with me. It's not, it's not that technical, but just for those of you that really want to know kind of the mechanism, I want to explain it fully, uh, so that you can really understand the value here. So I mentioned ATP adenosine triphosphate, three phosphates, right? So when your body is using, let's say carbohydrates or proteins or fats or whatever, doing its thing in order to produce ATP, ATP is uh, you know, it's like the energetic currency of, of the body. So when we have, uh, when this ATB is, 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 uh, being created, um, in, in that process of using that energy for whatever reason, um, uh, one of the phosphate groups is, is, uh, it's called hydrolyzed. So energy in that form of heat is given off. Um, and then one phosphate essentially from that ATP is like used up. So now we go from ATP triphosphate to diphosphate. We go to ADP, adenosine diphosphate. So now you have this like free ADP molecule, right? Um, which is essentially useless, <laughs> like it's kind of junk, unless you can kind of bind another phosphate to it um, to re to sort of re up it, let's say, um, to kind of chunk it back up, if you will, to ATP. And this is where the creatine comes in and becomes very, very important, where we can really augment your performance before that fatigue um, sets in. So what happens is the creatine is like, hey, I see that there's ADP here. I'm going to donate one of my phosphate uh, groups so that ADP can kind of chunk up again to form that ATP. Okay. Okay. So the next thing that, um, so now we have a little bit of the mechanism, right? So creatine is going to be super generous. Give one of its, uh, it's going to give its phosphate up so that ADP becomes ATP. So we're creating more energy locally. Okay. Without relying on other energetic systems, which is important. Now there's a couple of 
uh, you know, the, the question here was like creatine for women. So I've been kind of explaining, yes, big, big fan, a uh, huge fan. Um, the best time to take it again, some dialogue in terms of when I, um, I'm a, I'm less concerned about exactly the right time to take it versus like just taking it. So you can take it pre-workout if you want. I tend to take it post-workout just because um, that's kind of when I'm feeding. Like I, you know, I tend to work out fasted most of the time. And that was another question that I'm going to get to uh, today as well. It's like, which is better, fasted workouts or fed workouts? But uh, typically for my schedule, uh, I would say three of the five days that I train, three of those days have to be done fasted or else they're just not going to get done just by way of my schedule. Um, so I typically work out fasted, don't really like food, just like a personal preference. I don't really like to have a lot of food in, especially if I'm working out in the morning, I don't like food first thing. And like, I just feel like a rock is in my stomach. So i like to work out early in the morning anyway, fasted. And then after the workout, I I have some post workout nutrition. So that usually includes a protein. There's like protein with um, some water and I'll add some creatine into the water at that point. And then I might have some like, you know, oats that I've soaked overnight or, you know, something like something like that, like some carbohydrate. I might have a banana uh, in the shake, you know, whatever it is that whatever carbohydrates I'm consuming post shake. So, um, there's no perfect time to take it. You can take your pre-workout. It's going to give you the benefits. You can take it post-workout. I would, I would, uh, postulate, I would pontificate (laughs) that, um, I actually like taking creatine, you know, from a mechanistic perspective, I think after the workout, there are some benefits to that as well. Um, one, if you're feeding, like you're having some carbohydrates, right. And you're like, maybe the bananas in your shake, you know, or whatever the oats that you're consuming, whatever it is, we have insulin, naturally that's going to be available. And that, that helps to drive obviously substrate into the cells that also includes creatine. So I think that it helps to get, I mean, I could be totally wrong here, but I feel like with the insulin present in that post nutrition, like that post workout nutrition, insulin is helping to drive creatine, uh, into the muscle cell. Um, and I feel like your muscles are kind of hungry, especially if you've worked out fasted, they're just going to be a little bit hungrier and more adept at taking up nutrients, um, for substrate for, you know, reconfiguring and helping to heal the, um, uh, helping to heal the whole process. Okay. So, uh, typically, uh, a dosage here, uh, for, you know, you're, I, I don't think taking a creatine, uh, constantly is also a great idea because it's not like our bodies are dumb. Like they know that we're supplementing with them. So I typically cycle, uh, as I do most things, really, I typically cycle, uh, creatine. So you'll usually reach muscle saturation at about 30 or so days of like consistent, like if you're taking creatine every single day, um, you'll usually reach like saturation of the myocyte or like the, you know, the, we'll call it the musculoskeletal system as a whole at about 30 days. So I will typically take uh, creatine for like two cycles, so like two menstrual cycles, and then I I take a break for one or two cycles again, and then it starts again. So I like to, I like to cycle things at, you know, no surprise there. I like to cycle most things uh, and creatine is included in that as well. So I hope that that gives you a bit more color in terms of a like types of creatine. I don't have like any specific brand that I like. I do have an Amazon storefront that I will link in the show notes that has all like my post-workout nutrition and it has a whole bunch of other stuff in there, like stuff that I like for my kitchen and skin products and all that. But you, you'll find uh, the creatine that I use. I want to say it's BioSteel, but I can't, I can't recall off. It's just, it's honestly, as long as you find creatine monohydrate, that's the big thing that you want to be looking for on the label. So Yes to creatine. If you are 56, you're on HRT, you're postmenopausal. Absolutely. If you're 26 and in your, in your cycle and you're, you know, you're going to be, uh, you're looking to build a physique. It's it's good across the entire arc of life. The only thing to consider is kind of, you know, timing, you know, take, I like to take it after, but again, you can take it beforehand and then cycling it as well. So taking it consistently, uh, I think that you'll start to see uh, a bit of a habituation that tends to happen. So we want to, we want to downplay that a little bit by cycling it. So two cycles on two cycles off is like an easy kind of way to remember it. And I will also just say that 
if it's not perfect, like if you cycle for like one and then take two months off because you forgot and then you get back on again, it's totally, totally fine. As the name of the podcast suggests, we don't want to try to be perfect. We just try, want to try to get better. So if you're doing something, you know, um, and you, uh, you know, you've messed up a time or you've messed up timing, like as long as it kind of gets in there, it's you're doing better. Okay. Hence, that's actually why I named the podcast better because I didn't want to play into my own tendencies, actually, my own tendencies to try and be perfect all the time and try get to try to get everything right. Because when we think about all or nothing, the type A personalities that are listening, I know you, I see you because you are me and I am you. In the face of all or nothing, what do we choose? We choose nothing, right? Because we're like, no, if I can't do it perfect, forget it. I'm not even like throw the baby out with the bathwater. So don't worry about getting it perfect. Just start. All right. Next question. Uh, what is the best way to gain muscles for women? And I love this question because I can give you a really easy and lazy answer, which I'm going to do. And then I'm going to give you a really complicated answer because I like both. <laughs> okay. So the easy but lazy answer is you want to figure out a rhythm. And I, I shouldn't say it's lazy, but it's, it's kind of like a zoom out. It's like the 30,000 foot view here. So you want to find a consistent regimen of resistance training um, that you love uh, consistently that you can train with heavy weights. Now, certainly um, I have thoughts on if you're a woman in your reproductive years, how that training looks over the course of your menstrual cycle. And you can, you can read about all those details in the Betty body. And I'll touch on some of those um, aspects here too. Um, but as we get a little bit more granular, so the first thing is find something that you like to do and that you can do it consistently. That's the first thing, because if you hate it, it's good. You're going to maybe do it for a little bit and then you're going to drop off because you hate it. Your dopamine levels are going to drop every time you see it on your schedule. And it's just going to take like more coffee and more energy drink and more music and more self hyping up to get your, to get your butt down to the gym. So find something that you love to do. Okay. Um, when we look at the exercise regimen or program specifically, at a minimum, minimum effective dose, okay? So the minimum, so this is like the MVP, the minimum viable product, the minimum kind of output that I would like to see someone work up to if they're totally new to training is going to be at least three days of lifting, okay? So three days of resistance training, um, with a goal, once that's been achieved, to move that up to four, uh, maybe five days. And me personally, I kind of cycle between, <laughs> there's that word again, uh, I cycle between kind of four days and five days, depending on volume and how heavy I'm lifting and uh, what my what my goals are. But I would say that that is the base. So we start at three. And I think it would be a shame if you stopped there. So three is going to, you know, at three days a week, you are going to get massive benefits, right? You're going to look better. You're going to lose weight. You're going to improve your glucose disposal. You're going to improve insulin sensitivity. You're going to be driving a brain derived neurotrophic factor, lowering overall systemic inflammation, all the things. Okay. And we want to work you up to four. And if you're, you know, maybe five, but like four to five days is a beautiful base beautiful goal for you to work towards. And I would say that there, you don't have to include cardio until this routine is mastered until you've actually worked yourself up to that three days a week of training, nothing else really matters. And then getting even more granular when you're thinking about designing a program, there's a couple of ways uh, to do it. There's many ways, this is a terrible saying, but many ways to skin a cat. I don't know why I said, I've been, this is the saying that's coming up for me. And I'm like, why am I talking about skinning cats? But okay. So many ways to skin a, skin a cat, but the overarching goal here is to improve your strength. Um, uh, so the, my, it's like the muscle want, we want to get the muscle stronger over time, because that is going to lead to muscle growth. So starting at whatever weight feels heavy for you right now, okay, that is going to be different. Every single person who is listening to this podcast right now is going to choose a different number. Okay. So 
And of course, there's going to be sort of a bell curve of distribution in terms of like what, you know, the average weight is for each, you know, individual exercise. But your goal is like, it's, 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 meaningless in terms of where you fit in into that bell curve. What matters is what weight feels heavy to you right now. And then sticking with that and then having a long-term goal to slowly and steadily improve that weight or increase, I should say, that weight um, with time. This is something called progressive overload. It's a lot of different ways that you can do that. So weight, increasing the weight is one of them. Increasing your volume is another, uh, really potent way as well to increase strength. And I will say that, um, from a personal, uh, observational, uh, perspective and from the thousands of women that I've spoken to, most women will notice changes in strength before they actually notice aesthetic changes. So the muscle will get stronger. Like you'll jump in weight and the muscle might still look the same. And then a couple of weeks later, you'll be like, Oh, noticing a little bit more roundness in that butt or noticing a little bit more of those shoulder boulders, right? Like noticing a little bit more definition, let's say in the shoulder or the biceps or whatever. Um, and then for women, I'll also say just as a general comment, you'll usually notice changes in the upper body before you do in the lower body. And that is usually because women typically lose weight top to bottom. So we lose weight in the face and we lose weight in the upper body first, especially if you're a woman in her reproductive years. This is again, kind of back to that comment that I made before around being under the influence of estrogen. We tend to lose weight in the top half of the body first, and then the second half of the body or second half of the body. Oh my gosh, the lower half of the body, <laughs> the lower half of the body uh, thereafter. So you'll start to see kind of changes in the shoulder, maybe a little bit more definition in the shoulder blade or the back or the chest before you're going to start to see changes, let's say in the quads or the glutes or some of these like denser, thicker, uh, muscle groups. So just a, just a little like kind of thing to have in the back of your mind, women lose weight top to bottom. So if you are training upper body, which you absolutely should be, um, you'll start to notice changes, aesthetic changes, let's say in the upper body before you do in the lower body. So what are some of the principles of progressive overload? So I mentioned, you know, lifting as heavy as you can and increasing, steadily increasing the weight from there. Also increasing volume, getting even like a little bit more granular in terms of uh, what types of exercises you can choose. I like to typically, when I'm designing a program for a client, to start with compound movements, which are basically multi-joint movements. So if you think about um, think about a push-up, let's say. Push-up involves many joints flexing and extending in order to uh, perform the push-up. So we have flexion and extension of the shoulder at the elbow joint and the wrist. In the lower body, uh, a compound movement would be like a lunge or a squat where we're seeing flexion and extension at the hip joint proper. Uh, we're seeing it at the knee joint and at, we're seeing tibial torsion, uh, tibial flare, and then of course, ankle dorsiflexion or plantar flexion, uh, depending on what phase of the movement you're in. So compound movements first in the program. So if you have, let's say, 10 exercises that you're trying to get through, let's say, or 12 exercises or whatever. The first, you know, the first exercises that you're doing are compound movements, multi-joint. So it's the push-ups, it's the pull-ups, it's the row, it's the, you know, it's the barbell rows, it's the chin-ups or the pull-ups, uh, it's the squats, it's the lunges, it's the hip thrusters. Those come first and early in the program. And then we move into more single joint movements. So uh, an example of a single joint movement might be a bicep curl, right? So if you're thinking about, you know, what's, what joint is moving, it's primarily the elbow joint, right? That's flexing and extending. Now, of course, we know the bicep itself does cross two joints. It does cross the shoulder joint uh, as well because it, it crosses over um, one of the attachments crosses and attaches to the coracoid process. But uh, a bicep curl is primarily when we're thinking about single joints, I want you to think about one one thing that's moving. So with the bicep example, it's the elbow that's moving. In the lower body, you might think about a hamstring curl, right? So we see the knee is extending and flexing um, as well. Okay. So we're just, even though the, even though the hamstring crosses multiple joints, right? It's going to cross um, at the hip. It's going to cross at the knee, uh, even across into the tibia, uh, some uh, into like from the uh, fibula and tibula. Oh my goodness. 
fibula and tibia. Goodness. I, 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 I think I need to make my coffee a bit stronger because my words are all fumbling in my mouth. Uh, so we know that, you know, even though the muscle itself crosses multiple joints, there can be movements that isolate single joints. It's, it's kind of what I'm saying. Um, the other thing I want to just mention, uh, with women and weight lifting, um, is that typically women have more, uh, type one muscle fibers. What does that mean? I've talked about muscle fibers on the show, uh, in the past, but these are basically, we have a higher concentration of muscle fibers that, um, are oxidative in capacity, meaning that it takes, uh, for example, so I'll just kind of, uh, uh, just compare and contrast for you. So like a type one muscle fiber is the type of muscle fiber that's being activated in like walking, let's say, or like zone one training, uh, somewhat in zone two training as well. In type two fibers are, are involved in kind of more explosive type of movements. So things like sprinting and burpees and like, uh, you know, even, uh, weight training, like, uh, uh, weight training as well. These are like primarily recruiting, uh, type two fibers. And within type two, we have like subcategory type two, a and type two B. These are more glycolytic in nature, meaning that they're going to use either stored glycogen or, uh, glucose that's, that's in the blood that's available substrate for the muscle to use. Women have uh, compared to men, we have more type one, muscle fibers. So this is kind of where we see traditionally when we're looking at training regimens for females that we might see recommendations like 15 reps. It's like three sets times 15 reps. And, um, while I agree with that, I also think that we can, and while you can't like switch, like you can't change like type one muscle fibers to type two, you can specifically try to train and increase the girth, let's say, uh, of your type two, uh, and the performance of your type two muscle fibers. So I don't love, this is why I don't love like the three by 15 that you typically see for females. I think that there's an appropriate time in the cycle that we can be doing 15 or higher. And that typically, if you've read the book or you've heard me talk on the show before, you'll know that I really like a high rep, lower, relative lower weight, uh, in week four of a woman's menstrual cycle, because she tends to be more inflamed at that point. She tends to be a bit more miserable if she's going to have any symptoms of premenstrual syndrome, like the bloating and the mood changes, sleep changes, anything like that. It, you know, the more reps that you can get in is going to help reduce that overall systemic inflammation that many women experience. So I do like like a 15 to, you know, even up to 30, really like 15 to 20, 15 to 30 rep range in week four of a woman's menstrual cycle. And I like to play around with other rep ranges throughout the cycle, because I do think that we can be building up our type two, the performance uh, of our type two muscle fibers. So that's typically, um, you know, in week one and week three of the cycle, I typically will go for somewhere between eight and 12. Uh, and then week two of the cycle, I like a lower rep range, but really, really heavy weights. So like five to seven, five to eight um, reps. And again, just kind of coming back to this idea of like heavy, what's heavy, heavy is different for, you know, it's kind of a subjective term, like what might be heavy for me might be really light for you. Um, a way to, to evaluate that it, there's two ways. One is an RPE. So rate of perceived exertion. So out of 10, how much are you exerting? Uh, a heavy weight, if you were to kind of qualify it, would be somewhere between eight and 10 out of 10. Um, another way to think about it is actually the opposite, right? So how many, if I asked you to do more reps, how many more reps could you punch out? So this is called an RIR or reps in reserve, like how many do you got left in your girl? Um, and you know, I would say one to two, like three max should be your answer. That's what a heavy weight is. So for a woman to summarize, yes, you should train. Yes. You need to build up a base. It should be three at a minimum, ideally four. Your, your design of the program should move you from compound movements through so like multi joint movements through to single joint movements and this can be achieved in like a 3 day split 4 day split 5 day split um women have more type 1 muscle fibers than we do 
uh, type two. Um, and I think that the other, the other thing I'll, I'll say is our upper body is typically much weaker than our lower body. So this is another thing that I've noticed in my own journey in women that I've counseled is like, for example, on my hip thrust, I'm like North of 400 pounds on my hip thrust. Like I, I can push, like my glutes are so damn strong, but comparatively, let's say my chin ups, like I might be able to punch out, you know, eight before I'm done. Um, so comparatively lower to upper body, women are typically weaker in the upper body, which means that we, in order to sort of, you know, achieve that symmetry between upper and lower body, we should be training the upper body more frequently in my opinion. When I was in the clinic, I used to have some of these functional tests that I would run every new patient through. And I would ask the guys and the girls like, on your toes, how many push-ups can you do? This is, you know, how what's the upper body strength? Like we would have other tests like wall sits and grip strength and uh, you know, proprioceptive tests and balance tests and stuff. And without fail, my women, you know, they would be like, Oh, well, I want to do like a women's push-up. Can I do it on my knees? I was like, okay, well, you can, but I'd like to see you try one on your toes. Um, so of course, you know, women would be able to punch out, let's say five or six, let's say on their knees, and then we would get them on their toes and it would be maybe one, you know, and there'd be a lot of like sort of sagging, let's say in the midsection, like we'd see sort of a, you know, a lack of control or a lack of abdominal, uh, or core strength, we'll say, uh, with that toe push up. So women in general, like if you are someone who wants to create that hourglass figure, I would be thinking about training your upper body, um, I would say, you know, if, if you have, a, you know, if you're training more days, like if you're training a four or five day regimen, I'd be training your upper body twice as often as your lower body. Uh, and that's really because we are just, you know, just weaker generally. I mean, of course, there's going to be some genetic freaks and outliers to that statement, but for the rest of us, myself included, I have had to work like W E R K for my, for my upper body strength. Like even those eight chin ups that I mentioned, like that eighth one, man, like, let me tell you how ugly it is. Like there it's ugly. Like my knees and everything flaring. I'm trying to get myself up. Like I got to work for it. And I can like punch out like eight to 10 freaking 400 plus on, on, you know, on a hip thruster, let's say, or like, you know, around 200 on a squat, which is like, you know, more than like, you know, one point, whatever I, I have to do the calculation on that, maybe 1.2 uh, times my Maybe that's not right. I, I, let me do the calculation, but it's like, you know, more than my body weight. Like I'm like a buck 35, right? A buck, you know, buck 40 near my menstrual cycle. So for me to be able to do a squat that's about 200 pounds tells you that the lower body, at least, you know, my constitution, but it's not just an N of one. This is like many women that I've looked at and trained over time. We tend to be able to make really big gains in our lower body. Um, not so much in the upper body. So it's important when we're thinking about aesthetics, right? And when we're thinking about, and just functionality, like I want to have a strong upper body, right? So we want the hourglass figure, right? We need like the shoulder boulders. Uh, so building out the coronal plane is really important, but then also just from a longevity perspective, like I want to be able to pick up my grandkids. I want to be able to travel with my, you know, with my luggage and not have someone like not have to get a man or anyone else to be able to take my luggage off of the rotating. I don't know what those things are called, but when you're in the airport and the, you know, your luggage comes down on that conveyor belt and it's like, circuit, I want to be able to pick it up myself. Um, so I think that those are, those are things that I think about as well. And that requires like grip strength, upper body strength, proprioception, all the things, right. Balance control, core strength, all, all the things. So that's my long ass answer for you there. I hope that, that helps. Um, another question that came in, which was what are some, uh, nutrition and training, uh, or the question is, can I, uh, train and what would my nutrition look like for muscle growth while limiting fat gain? And I love this question because I get it all the time. And it's something that I really want to educate everybody on in terms of, like, yes, you can do both. You can gain muscle and you can limit fat gain. Um, and um, it is inevitable. It is physiologically impossible to not put on fat 
when you are putting on muscle, like you're, you're not just like, just going to down all the protein shakes and your brought your brains and be like, Oh, I guess she doesn't want to limit any fat. Like your brain's like, excuse me, we need to have a menstrual cycle. We need to put some, we need to put some of this junk in the trunk. Okay. So that, that being said, uh, it's not all fat. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can just put on muscle, um, uh, without putting on any fat. So just know that that's part of the equation. I would certainly say that it's easier um, to focus on each of these at a time, right? So it's easier to focus on being in a build phase where we know that there's going to be some fat accumulation, like, but we can also minimize it. And when we want to prioritize fat loss, uh, going into kind of what's, what might be called a cut or a cutting phase. Okay. So it's easier to kind of separate those out. That's actually how I uh, train. So I'm either in a build, which is like most of the time, where I'm eating calories either at maintenance or slightly above maintenance to give my body the building blocks that it needs to put on muscle. And then I will do a cut for a really short period of time. So I just recently did a little cut. I actually totally messed up my timing. I was supposed to be in a cut for eight weeks and I only ended up being in a cut for five, but whatever. Um, so a cut might be like two months maximum, right? Because I was trying to just diet down to, you know, we were doing a photo shoot and I just wanted to kind of look a little bit leaner. Um, but then at, right at the, literally like that evening, it's like back into the build, like, you know, had my little, you know, had my burger, uh, had my, you know, my free meal, if you will, or my whatever, whatever meal, like not on the diet didn't matter. Uh, and then kind of got right back at it. So I understand, first of all, I understand I am like you. I also want to limit fat gain. I have a relatively, uh, I probably have a bit of a, a bigger tolerance than most just because I've, uh, just because of the amount of muscle that I've, that I've, you know, put on over the decades of whatever time training, but um, I think most women, I do know that most women have a very low tolerance for putting on fat. Okay. Um, and I think women in particular are probably petrified, like probably terrified uh, of weight gain of any kind. Uh, even if you're putting on muscles, like, oh my God, I just want to be 128 on the scale. Why am I 135? Like I hear that all the time. Um, so I just want to, I just want to, um, let you know that I hear you and I love you and it's okay. And it's okay to be scared. And I'm going to, I'm here to guide you. That's what I'm here to do. So, um, if you are putting on weight and it's muscle weight, um, this is going to cause the scale to jump. Like your muscle is heavy. Um, there isn't any getting around that. Um, it's, you know, it's heavier, denser, more metabolically active than let's say adipose tissue is. Um, so if I was, uh, so I, like I mentioned, I like to do this in phases, but first, if we were trying to say, okay, she wants to put on muscle and minimize fat gain. First, I want the first thing I want to understand is how many calories are you consuming? Okay. So, uh, how many calories are you consuming on a daily basis? What is the macro composition of the diet currently? So what, how much protein are you taking in? How many carbohydrates are you taking in? How much fat, um, are you taking in? And then if you were a patient of mine, of course, the other thing I would throw in there is like a, you know, some blood work, um, and some hormonal testing to kind of establish what your baseline is right now. Um, if the goal of course, as you've mentioned is like, how do we put on muscle limit fat gain? Probably the first thing I'm going to have to do. Um, and I'm just speaking from experience here is I'm going to have to overcome. There's a very high probability that this woman that you are <laughs> over uh, under eating, you're not eating enough. Okay. Because you're probably petrified of weight gain. So, uh, this is where something like a reverse diet might come in really handy where I, and a reverse diet. Um, this is something that we go over with in my Estima certification program, where we teach clinicians actually how to run a reverse diet with their clients, because nine times out of 10, of, you know, when we have these 42 or 48 year old women, they're like, it doesn't work anymore. I'm on the Peloton six days a week and I'm still gaining weight and I still have this belly weight. Um, it's probably, it was probably true for her that she was able to restrict her calories when she was 20 or 30 and lose weight. And now she's kind of brought her calories down from let's say 1600 to 1500. And it's kind of whittled down to 14 and 13. And then like, I've had some women that have been eating, um, you know, uh, like 1100, 1000, 1100 calories a day. I had one woman recently tell me that she counts, there's one gram of carbohydrates in an egg. And I just kind of like, 
had to catch my face. I was like, what do you mean? You know, like I, that's not the first thing I think about when I think of an egg, I think about the, the albumin, I think about the protein, I think about the fat and the choline and like all the good stuff in the yolk. I don't actually think, I don't actually think about if I'm not putting it into an app, the carbohydrates that are there, but she was concerned about the one gram of carbohydrates uh, in her egg. So I see this all the time. And so I'm saying this with love because I really want you as the listener, you are my Betty. I've got your back. Like we have to get over this idea uh, or being scared of eating food for muscle gain. So very high probability that we are going to take a very, uh, uh, we're taking some under eating behavior and we're going to slowly and methodically, I'm not going from 1100 to 1800 overnight, but we're going to very slowly, strategically and methodically start to increase her caloric intake, probably not by much, like 40 to call it 80 calories uh, per week um, to slowly start reversing some of that metabolic adaptation that happens when you are chronically calorically restricted. Like when you've been restricting your calories for weeks. And let's just be honest with some of these women, it's been decades. Uh, there are metabolic adaptations that happen, right? Your BMR slows down. You don't, um, actually, um, uh, you don't expend as much energy during your workouts. Like your body's like trying to conserve as much as it can. So your workouts are less effective. Your digestion really slows down. So there's a lot of GI problems that tend to tend to, tend to creep up around that as well. So we slowly and methodically like kind of stoke the fire of the metabolism, so to speak, usually 40 to 80 calories per week is where I play around with, with most women. Um, so I'll bring them back up to maintenance, um, a really easy way to kind of figure out your, um, uh, your maintenance is like your ideal weight, let's say like whatever your ideal weight is. And you multiply that by 15, 16, 17 ish. Right. And that kind of gives you your, uh, that kind of gives you a caloric, um, uh, number, or you can do like a Harris Benedict equation or something a bit more uh, intense, but know that these are very imprecise, right? You're going to have to play and you're going to have to be weighing yourself and measuring yourself to see kind of how things are changing with time. So general, uh, general kind of thinking there is like ideal body weight times, call it 16, or you can run something like the Harris Benedict equation as well. So we move this woman back up to maintenance calories. Okay. Maintenance calories means that you are net net as close to zero. Like your body expends a certain amount of calories every day just to stay alive. Uh, so we have moved your caloric consumption up to that maintenance. And then, uh, or, okay, so there's either the maintenance calories or depending on the woman, uh, I might do like a super itty bitty, teensy weensy, teeny weeny little caloric deficit, hundred calories, maybe maximum, maybe 200. Um, and then I'm, so there's like, you know, we're basically at, at maintenance or just like a slight deficit. And then I'm going to design an exercise program. And I want to think about uh, that you know, again, thinking about the resistance training being the base. So minimum of three days to start, as I've mentioned, ideally working up to four days, maybe five days of resistance training. And then of course the next tier, like if we were to think about like, what's the exercise and movement program as a whole, the base is going to be resistance training three to five days, depending on the individual. The second sort of tier, if you will, is going to be general movement. So neat non-exercise activity thermogenesis. How many steps are you taking? How much, you know, as if you're watching this on YouTube, you can kind of see my hands flaring up all over the place because, you know, I'm taking it, taking a chapter from my Italian family. Like we talk, you know, we talk with our hands, right? Lots of Europeans all with our hands everywhere all the time. And it's like, gosh, are you guys fighting? It's like, no, we're just talking about dinner. <laughs> Right. So uh, those are kind of spontaneous movements, right? Like walking, gardening, uh, kind of puttering around the kitchen, tidying up, speaking like an Italian, you know, as, as I'm doing now, I'm kind of, of course, now I'm exaggerating it for you to see this on YouTube, but you know, my, my, you know, arms are kind of moving just like spontaneous movement. These little things burn more calories. This is actually kind of the show pony, if you will, of weight loss, because what happens, of course, when you're in a caloric deficit and you're miserable, you don't want to move, right? So the hands don't move, the affect is down, the facial contractions, everything kind of, everything kind of uh, attenuates. Um, but if you're consuming more calories, you're generally happier and there's a little bit more spontaneous movement. 
um, that happens. Uh, so if it's a step, uh, you know, if it's a step goal somewhere between, you know, at minimum, bare minimum of 2000 steps a day at the very minimum up to about 8,000 steps a day is kind of like the goal. Um, and you can work up from there. Uh, but 8,000 steps would be kind of where I'm trying to get you to. And then, um, you know, for like, for me, for example, I have, a you know, I don't get a lot of like steps during the day because I'm usually on calls or I'm recording something like this, or, uh, you know, I'm at the desk working. So I have a desk treadmill um, where I will work at the desk, but I'm walking at a really slow pace, like somewhere between two and three miles an hour. Uh, again, I have it linked in my Amazon storefront. So I'll make sure that that link is available for you. If you want to see the one that I use. Um, and then the next sort of tier up. So we have like base of resistance training. Then we have neat or like kind of general movement, non-exercise activity, thermogenesis. And then the next piece is cardio. Okay. So a lot of weight training, should be somewhere in zone two, three. Um, and then I'll add in for this person, if they're, if they're wanting to kind of shred, maybe after we've established like a three to five day training, we have, you know, 8,000 steps happening. Then we're going to say, okay, I will throw in like one, maybe two, but it's usually just one, uh, day of cardio training per week. Uh, and it's going to be in that zone two range. So uh, when we had Phil Maffetone on the show, uh, he was talking a lot about maximal aerobic capacity. I really like his formula of 180 minus your age. That's how you figure out what your zone two is generally. Okay. So um, me being 44 years young, uh, my zone two is approximately 136. Okay. So kind of when my heart rate is around 136, that, that's about zone two subjectively at 136, I can still, assuming I've done the math there, my God, it'd be so embarrassing if I haven't, if I've been doing it wrong all this time, but I'm pretty sure that that's right. 180 minus 44 is 136. Um, but I can still keep a conversation going at 136. Like I'm not huffing and puffing. Like it's no problem for me to continue that. Um, I have a lateral trainer um, that I find is very easy to stay in that, um, zone two. I also have a bike that I can kind of set the, uh, I'm on Zwift, by the way, if anyone wants to be friends with me and we can do some rides together on Zwift, but, uh, I'm on Zwift. So I can either like choose the route that I'm doing. I know it's going to be like a flat hill or whatever, and I can kind of set how, how, what my output's going to be. Um, so that's another way that you can kind of control it as well. You can do it running too, if you're someone who loves to run, but I find that, um, for most people, we kind of blast that as zone two really, really quickly with a run. So like a brisk uh, walk maybe would be appropriate there as well. So I'll link Phil's, my conversation uh, with him in the show notes, because he has these, uh, these other qualifications that I really liked as well. Like if you're over, you know, if you're sick or you're overtrained or you're on medication, like that number keeps, like he keeps subtracting that number. Um, so that number keeps getting lower and lower um, for you to kind of, you know, as a, as a general marker. So I love that. Okay. And the last piece around this question, um, maybe the most important piece of advice that I'll give is take your damn time. Just be the tortoise, not the hare, uh, you know, to kind of throw reference to, um, you know, a, ch a childhood fable around, you know, taking your time and steady, slow and steady wins the race. Like putting on muscle takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of setbacks, frustration and dedication. Okay. It doesn't, again, doesn't need to be done perfectly. Okay. It just needs to be done. So stop waiting for the perfect time to my type A. Stop waiting for the perfect time. Stop waiting for the perfect plan for the perfect gym outfit. Just like freaking do it. Just do something, even if it's like a four out of 10. Okay. Just figure something out and do it. Um, this, this is why like these super strict, like biohacking principles of only five of the, like you have to wake up and I'm part of the 5 a.m. club. And if I wake up at six, I'm a loot. Like none of this, like th this is like, utter nonsense. Okay. Like what I want you to remember is better is better than perfect. Okay. Again, back to the name of the show. Better is better. Better is better than best. Okay. Like it's better is better than perfect. As long as you are doing something like good goddess of ISIS, anything, as long as you are doing anything, it's better than nothing. Okay. So stop waiting for everything to be perfect and the perfect day and the perfect motivation, the perfect hair and the perfect, like it's not going to happen. So just like get dirty, you know, grunt <laughs> and just like get after it. Okay. 
And I'll, I'll say this is like a little bit of philosophy here. Uh, but I think that this is kind of a, a really good parable for life as a whole, right? Like anything worth having requires work, right? It requires dedication. It requires a surrender to the monotony of doing the same thing day in, day out, whether or not you feel like it. So my advice here is like, stop majoring in the minors. Stop thinking about all the small little details that have to fall into place for you to move forward. Just do it. The supplement stack, the nutrient timing doesn't matter as much as like getting in the gym, getting dirty, making some sex noises, (laughs) right? While you're lifting those heavy weights and those grunting noises, because ladies, you know, just like with sex, if you haven't made a lot of noises in the gym, you've wasted your time. <laughs> okay. So there I should step off my soapbox. Um, and on to the next question. Okay. So the next, the next question is uh, aminos, amino acids. Do you, do you recommend uh, aminos before a workout? Uh, do they break a fast? Um, really, I can really answer this one much shorter than some of the other ones, but I'm just generally not a fan uh, of aminos. Um, like overall, I don't consume them. I don't think that they have any substantial amount of value when it comes to performance, uh, when it comes to resistance training in general. Uh, I think it just gives you like expensive pee. That's, that's kind of my take on them. Um, as I've mentioned, I, I typically work out fasted. So I'm just having like some, you know, have some coffee, you know, like a cup of espresso, let's say beforehand. And then I kind of get after it with some water or whatever, sometimes ketones as well. If I'm really feeling like, I need a little lift. Um, so, uh, I don't usually consume any foods, uh, prior to lifting. And even in my pre-workout drink, like no aminos, nothing. Um, I will say that, um, what I would think is superior to amino. So usually the first half of the week, just my kids schedule, um, I have to work out in the morning. Like that's just when it's going to get done in the second half of the week. Like usually Thursdays and Fridays, um, I can't work out in the morning just because of their like commitments. And, you know, we're running around to doing all the like preschool things. And, um, so I'm, you know, unless if I work out at 4am, um, I can't really work out in the morning and I'm just simply not willing to do that. So on those days, I actually work out in the evening, like kind of the later afternoon, like kind of that four or five o'clock time. Um, and that's usually the earliest that I can even start thinking about weights. And obviously by four o'clock I've eaten something. Um, and I will say that when we're thinking about in, maybe instead of aminos, let's say, um, playing around with being fed or being in the fed state and seeing how that affects um, your performance might be something to consider. Because what I've noticed is on those Thursdays and Fridays, when I train in the afternoon, like that four or five o'clock kind of time, I do feel stronger. Like I do feel like my performance is enhanced. So if it was like unicorns and sparkles and rainbows, like the best time would be to work out at two o'clock in the afternoon where I've had one to two meals by that point, core body temperature has peaked. My joints are warm. Like, you know, I've had some general movement through the day. Um, so I would say, um, aminos, I'd, I'd say like a hard no on aminos, like no, no desire. No, I don't think there's any enhancement uh, to them. Um, pre-workout nutrition, um, I think needs to be, if you're going to be working out in a fed state, probably is going to be the meals that you've had that day. Um, and then post-workout nutrition, again, no need for aminos there either. Like, I think that if you follow your, if you follow those workouts with some protein, chase it down with some creatine, as we've been talking about, and some carbohydrates, like the oats or the banana and smoothie or whatever it is. Uh, I think that that's a really great, uh, call it stack, if you will. Um, for enhancing performance, but aminos are just like a, just like a no for me. Okay. Uh, someone here is, uh, asking confused about preload. So like pre-workout nutrition, you do a fasted workout versus Stacy, uh, Sims. Do we preload for a 20 minute workout? Okay. So I've, uh, a lot of people have compared Stacy uh, and me uh, w- because we both talk about cycles and we talk about uh, performance and training and stuff. And there's a lot of her body of work that I agree with. And I think all else equal, I think that if you can consume food before a lift, it's better. Um, as I mentioned, just 
by the uh, sort of constriction or the limitations of my schedule, I work out fasted just because that's the, if I don't get it in that day, it's not getting in. Um, but when you eat prior to train, of course, allowing for digestion and all of that, uh, it does appear, even the literature suggests this, that it does appear to be superior uh, to fasted workouts with the, with the specific lens of looking at muscle growth. So um, I don't eat prior to training sort of in the first half or a third of the, or, you know, first two thirds of the week, say, just because of, you know, limitations to my schedule. But if it was like unicorns and sparkles and rainbows, I'd work out at two o'clock, uh, which never is, is an option for me because I'm usually getting my kids around that time. But I, if I could, it would be perfect time would be two o'clock in the afternoon um, where I've had some food, joints are warm, nice and lubricated, you know, incidence of injury is going to be, you know, lower than, than when I train mostly, which is like, you know, first thing in the morning. Um, so yeah, I do think that if you can eat beforehand, I think that's better. Uh, again, coming back to like better and best, you just sometimes just got to do what works for you. I've been able to put on a substantial amount of muscle in a fasted state, um, for many, many years, even though that's not ideal because I've just done it because it works. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, is it normal to get a big glucose spike during fasted exercise? These like Betty's you ask good questions. I love these questions. Okay. So the answer is yes, it's normal. Um, if you are tracking your glucose, like let's say you are, uh, you have like a, uh, CGM, like a continuous glucose monitor, let's say, uh, you might notice that during your, um, workout that you are going to see a glucose rise during high intensity exercise, weight training will do it. Cardio will do it. You shouldn't be worried about this in any way. Um, despite the acute rise, uh, in glucose, high intensity training actually improves. Okay. So over the long term, the adaptations, uh, actually improves both fasting and glucose and actually insulin sensitivity, uh, over time. So, um, when we are um, uh, when we are doing high intensity activity, like uh, it could be like a hit training, maybe you're working up to zone five, or it's resistance training where you're kind of oscillating between zone two and three, and then kind of up to five and maybe back down again. Better adaptations, better metabolic flexibility, and glucose control with time. Because actually, and the reason, and I'll, I'll say that the reason why the, we are seeing that glucose rise is because. Exercise is a stress, right? It is a hormetic stressor. So it has both acute and chronic uh, effects on the body. Uh, acutely, of course, it is going to be, um, you know, you know, we can see like stress hormones that are going to tell like the liver to release stored glycogen in the bloodstream, which is where you see that, that glucose spike happening from. Um, and so that's why it's, it's not unusual to see that glucose, that glucose spike. Um, so don't be afraid of the glucose spike. It's totally normal. Uh, we actually even see this in, you know, in fasted individuals um, in the morning, like some people who are trying to get into ketosis, they'll say, I don't understand. Like I'll do a lumen or I'll test my blood glucose or whatever. And it's very much that I am, uh, I, I'm seeing like high glucose levels. And this is something slightly different. It's called the Dawn effect. Um, but a, potentially a similar mechanism, right? Where our stress hormones, where we have cortisol and adrenaline and noradrenaline are telling the liver to release stored glycogen into the bloodstream to produce new glucose, to be able to kind of fuel, uh, you know, in, in, in the case of exercise, you know, the, the, the stressor, right. The fight or flight, right. That that's happening. Like that stress response is happening in the, um, case in the morning, let's say when someone has like a higher blood glucose and they've been fasting all night, it could also just be that there's a sympathetic, there's sort of some nervous, uh, system, uh, dysregulation, um, that's, a, that's happening. So when we see this rise, right? This is an indication that you're mobilizing stored glycogen. Okay. So like back to kind of what we were talking about with creatine, meaning the workout is too intense for your body to just rely primarily on fat or that phosphocreatine system. And we need to pull out the glucose for fuel. Um, this is completely different Okay. So if you are wearing a CGM, this is completely different than eating a cookie and then looking at your glucose spike. Okay. Like they're two different things, right? Um, 
excellent exercise related spikes are actually a good thing. They're associated with an improvement in long-term insulin sensitivity. So don't be worried about that. Totally normal, totally all good. Like you're doing the right thing. Don't stop. Um, okay. And the last question, um, potentially uh, that I'll answer for today's AMA is my favorite protein powder. Of course, uh, this is like the easy one, let, let, you know, save the best for last, if you will. Uh, this is a product called Shkanusa. It is uh, very hard to pronounce. It is named after uh, a Greek island. The company is um, based, I believe they're based in Toronto, but they ship, they are available across Canada and across the US. It is a fabulous, fabulous product. So they have prebiotics and probiotics and they have just the chocolate is hands down my absolute favorite. Um, I actually reached out to them because I buy so much of their product. I'm like, Hey, like, can I, you know, talk about this product and like offer my listeners, um, a discount. So we do have a discount. Uh, I believe it's a 10% discount code, uh, in the show notes for you to, uh, to use at your, uh, at your uh, pleasure. Uh, I believe the code is Dr. Estima dot 10. And that gives you 10% off of pretty much anything in the store, but take my word for it. Betty's do the chocolate and the, the vanilla is like my second favorite. So I do the vanilla, um, when I, when I want maybe some berries or, or whatnot, but absolutely do the chocolate and the vanilla. They are both fabulous. My favorite protein in the history of ever. Uh, but, and that'll be in the show notes for you, um, as well. All right. Well, I think that this brings us to the top of our first AMA that we have uh, done in a while. Um, I hope that you found this really valuable. There's going to be a ton of information for you uh, as references in the show notes. Uh, let me know what you think of these AMAs. Do you still want them? Uh, so please leave us a, a rating or review. Uh, as I mentioned, we read all of them. We can, we have them coming in internationally, uh, Canada and the US, of course, Europe and Australia and New Zealand and all the places and Africa and, you know, all all, all, and uh, all across Asia. So I just want to, I want to hear from all of my Bettys worldwide, my Betty army. Uh, you want more AMAs. Uh, and if you do, then I'm going to continue doing it. So with that, I will bid you adieu and I will see you next time. In this next video, Dr. Sarah Godfried and I are talking about keto for women and why it is exquisitely different for us. We are talking in this next video about the testosterone advantage, cortisol, and the way that you can do keto right as a woman. Click over here and I'll see you there. It's not a blanket statement that keto is good for everyone. I want to be sure that that comes through loud and clear because we have to personalize.